Welcome to part one of a series in which we'll be taking a closer look at a man who's had a lot of history here in Impact Wrestling. He was an Impact original, and that's Frankie Kazarian. You returned this year after an eight-year hiatus, but I want to go all the way back to the beginning. What led you to joining Impact Wrestling? Ironically enough, I met and became friends with a man by the name of Scott Demore on an overseas tour in 2002. I also met Jeff Jarrett at that point. Both of those guys obviously were key players in the early days of TNA, Impact Wrestling. And they were impressed with what they saw on, a, on this particular tour. Several months later, I got a call from Scott Demore in the summer of 2003. You know, he said, we're interested in giving you a shot. You know, can you be available Wednesday? And this was Monday, yes I could. And they brought me in and brought me back the next week, and brought me back the next week, and brought me back the next week, and I think this is gonna work out. And, you know, a couple weeks turned into a couple months, a couple months turned into a, a decade plus, so uh, it's really kind of a cool full circle thing for me that Scott Demore has now got the keys to the castle, because he was the guy that was my kind of go-to guy to get me into the company in the first place all 20 years ago. So in those early days, you were a cornerstone of the X Division. Tell me, what was it like being a young talent, having that type of pressure, being in that position? Honestly, I was having the time of my life. That's all I ever wanted to do. From the time I was seven years old, I wanted to wrestle. And I didn't even really, at that time, care what initials were on the skirt or the ring apron. But I was getting this opportunity in this new company, and I was being allowed the opportunity to make a name for myself. And I was wrestling against some of the most incredible talents in the world. Guys like Chris Saban, The Amazing Red, Jerry Lynn, one of my heroes, one of my mentors, low key, Christopher Daniels. I got, I got put in a world title match with AJ Styles a month into being here. I felt pressure then, world title match. I'm brand new to this place. But other than that, I was just, I was just trying to make my name. I didn't necessarily look at it as feeling pressure. I was trying to make my name, and I know I had an opportunity in this unique thing called the X Division. I had no reason to think it was going to become what it's become. And when I look at the X Division now, and when I see those guys doing what they're doing, I wear my time in the X Division like a badge of honor, because that was the time of my life. I was in there with my friends. I was having the type of wrestling matches I wanted to have, and I was being given this opportunity on the pay-per-view at that time to do this. So. You know, what people might describe as pressure, I, th I thrived in that environment because I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. So in reference to those guys that you were wrestling with every week, what was the bond like among all of that young talent? I mean, it had to be close. The only thing I can compare the bond I share with a lot of my fellow wrestlers is to somebody who has fought in a war. And I can certainly never put myself in that position, but I've heard stories about guys in foxholes together. And when they come home, they have this bond, this something that connects them forever. And I'm lucky to have that with a plethora of guys because of our history. Chris Saban and I roomed together at the Motel 8 in the same room for years, in the same room. You know, Alex Shelley and Chris Saban and I the Amazing Red, Sanjay Dutt, those guys, we would fly from Nashville to Orlando. We'd get to Orlando, we'd go eat together. We just, it was, that was us. Later on, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels. Every week, we were in the same room, one room, sharing one room, in the same car. Those three guys just happened to be the guys that stood up with me at my wedding. Chris Daniels was my best man. Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, right there. That's the bond, that's, to me, what I'm gonna take away from this business, long after my days in the ring are done, that bond, those gentlemen are still gonna be with me. So obviously, early days in TNA, it was a place for young talent to really thrive, but there was also a good mix of some veterans in there as well. What was that like, mixing those two? For me, invaluable, because in this business, you're only gonna learn if you're in there with somebody that's better than you. Getting the opportunity to wrestle a series of matches with a guy like Jerry Lynn, who again, I cannot sing his praises high enough. I got an education every time I was in there. God, I got to wrestle guys like Sting, 
Jeff Jarrett, if you can't be in the ring with guys of that nature and not learn something, that's on you. So I, again, I thrived in that environment. However, there was, you know, this was kind of the tail end of the Wild West of pro wrestling. And I don't know how else to put it, there was a lot of kind of the good old boy system still in place. And that started to creep in and us younger guys at the time kind of saw that and, you know, we're taken, taken a bit back by that. Luckily, that environment doesn't exist anymore, but at the time, it was something that we were very cautious of. So obviously, you learned a lot from those veterans. Can you tell me about what are some of those valuable lessons that you took away? A lot. Early on, I had a high school football coach named Coach Beckham, who I loved to death, and he gave me some advice that has stuck with me to this day that I tell people, young wrestlers, aspiring wrestlers. You have two ears and one mouth, so you can listen twice as much as you talk. And I always, I always put that into place, especially in the wrestling business, especially when I'm in a locker room with my peers, with veterans. Again, going back to Jerry Lynn, I learned how to conduct myself as a professional inside and outside of the ring by being around a guy like Jerry Lynn and Chris Daniels. These are guys that are pros, pros. Not just what they do in the ring, but how they conduct business. And I learned that this is in fact a business because I was just a kid having the time of my life, but I learned there's a whole underbelly to pro wrestling that is a business. And sometimes it's a dirty business. So in all the good, valuable lessons I learned, I also learned what I didn't want to become. I did not want to become one of these veterans that are clinging to their spot, not because they believe in themselves, clinging to their spot because they don't want anybody coming close to taking what they have, not giving any younger guy a chance. And this wasn't just guys in the ring. This was guys that had the pencil. This was guys that were, you know, steering the ship for where we were gonna go. I saw a lot of nastiness. I saw a lot of ugliness. I saw, I saw a lot of angry old timers who, you know, had no, no room for what we were doing in the next division. You know, I saw a lot of bitter people clinging to a spot. And I never don't want to enjoy doing this where I come to work and I'm mad and I'm upset and I'm protective and, I, and I'm confrontational. There was a lot of that. There was a lot of that. And there was more of that than, than I liked. And I saw the dirty business side of this creeping into what I loved. And it begins to take a toll on you. This business takes a toll on you physically, but it takes way, way more of a toll on you emotionally. So clearly a lot of positive, but also a lot of negative. So let's fast forward. What led to you leaving TNA in 2014. At that point, it seemed like it was just time. I have nothing but wonderful memories and what impact did for me and my career, I could never repay the people involved in that because they put me on the map. They gave me a platform to do what I do. I had multiple X Division title reigns, multiple tag team title reigns. I was in so many first ups, first King of the Mountain X Division match, first Terra Dome match, all, all these. I just, I did so many cool things. and. And that's what I choose to take with me from that, my first time here. Fast forward to 2014, uh, you know, it's no secret that things were kind of topsy-turvy in the world of this company. Management was constantly rolling over, constantly changing. The regime in at the time made no bones about it. They didn't care for what I was doing. They didn't care for what Chris Daniels was doing, who was my tag team partner at the time. No plans, you are pushed aside, pushed aside, pushed aside. And honestly, I felt at that time disrespected for what I'd given this company to just be shoved aside, shoved aside, shoved aside. It was time to go and my contract was coming up. And at that time, both sides thought the best thing I could do would be to walk away. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs>